Greg, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk uh, today. Let's start with um, an introduction of uh, what you're what you're doing now and what you've done in the in the recent past. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to join you in the class uh, today. I'm in a little bit of a transition myself. I've, I've actually just started my own firm with uh, one of my great friends and partners. Uh, and so we're very excited about what that means. Uh, but for the last 10 plus years, I was uh, at Sasaki Associates where I did a, a significant amount of campus planning, uh, pretty much on a national basis. And uh, before that, uh, let's talk about your, ask you to talk about your academic yeah. background. Yeah, so I, um, I'm definitely a little bit of an oddball. Uh, I have no official training in any of the design disciplines other than my uh, great apprenticeship with some wonderful uh, practitioners. Uh, but my, my academic training is actually in mathematics, of all things. Uh, and it turns out that studying chaos theory as, as a graduate student has prepared me perfectly for, for life as a campus planner. So uh, that's worked out well. <laughs> I love that, the notion of chaos theory uh, because sometimes working on a campus does does seem to be a, a bit like that uh, for this conversation I'd like for us to focus for a moment on not the bricks and mortar of these places but the way they're they're used how do you how do you think about that yeah funny funny you should ask um, it, it's been an incredible journey because, as I say, I, I started not knowing anything. And, and the beauty of not knowing anything is that it frees you up to ask some really stupid questions, 99 out of 100 of which are very, very poor, and one of which might, might actually be helpful. And, you know, even though I was fortunate to work with some great teams, even from an early stage, um, one of the things that, that struck me and, and others was how you couldn't sort of just draw red blocks on a diagram and sort of say that was the plan uh, and that it, it really needed some kind of, for want of a better word, analysis function that enabled you to introduce data into the conversation in a meaning. See, I'm still young enough and naive enough to believe you can have a rational decision-making process within a university environment. I recognize that this is probably somewhat unlikely. Uh, but, but the extent to which you can have some kind of analysis function that ena enables you to sort of surface facts um, and then use that to drive decision making was, was one key. Uh, and the other key, which relates to time in a, in a couple of interesting ways, uh, is that um, what, what about planning is useful? Uh, and sometimes the plan is actually not that useful and it's the planning process that is useful. So how do you enable people to make good decisions over time? What's a process that supports that within a uh, you know, shared governance model? How do you introduce financial factors into thinking about all of that kind of stuff? And it behooves you, as soon as you start thinking about capital planning, to understand how you're using the space that you have uh, before you make decisions about new space. So that, that was a little bit of the journey in, into some of the things we'll, we'll talk about today. Yeah. Well, certainly the the decision-making process within a complex organization takes um, what takes elements from a variety of domains uh, the political reality the fiscal yeah. reality the uh, particular calendar point in which uh, an institution is and then the variables of uh, leadership uh, and the reality of uh, the complexity of decision making. Uh, in this course, we will have, uh, we'll be dealing with that uh, complexity uh, in other settings. But what I'd like to move towards is that uh, category that I believe we would all call facilities utilization. Uh, let's let's peel that onion a bit, and then we'll get to talk about the experience that you had at the University System of Georgia. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, I I think what struck me as I was kind of uh, coming up and learning the ropes was that you know most uh, facilities utilization analysis ten years ago was focused towards projecting space needs. Again, you have to remember the times. Uh, you know, everybody was growing gangbusters. A new building was going up every five minutes. Enrollments were all going up, and so to some extent, that kind of made sense. 
Uh, and I, I think a lot of very well-intentioned people kind of generated formulas where you sort of plug in enrollments or number of contact hours in a classroom or whatever the case may be, and the formulas would chug along and say, okay, well, in that case, you need, you know, X square feet of this kind of space. And, and that, was, that was pretty much the, the model uh, when I started. What struck me with that model was that the predictive nature of the formulae weren't matching the lived experience that many of my great clients had. Uh, and so you sort of get some projection that said, you must have 100,000 square feet of classroom space. And an institution would only have 75,000 square feet of classroom space, but in that 75,000 square feet of classroom space, they actually weren't meeting their existing utilization targets. So what's up with that? Um, it sort of raised some some sort of alarm bells. And so, you know, we, we, again, working with with a bunch of really terrific and talented people, um, as you start sort of peering under the hood of these formulae, you start to understand that in many cases, they, they make a great number of assumptions, largely having to do with averages. Um, so my favorite example is imagine that there's a, a university with only two classrooms. One has 10 seats, one has 100 seats. And suppose that on average, the university uses the rooms 50 percent well if it's 50 50 in the two rooms you'll get one answer but if it's 75 25 you can see huge variances and the formulae aren't nuanced enough to pick up on that kind of detail uh, so that that's one sort of somewhat trite example about just something that sort of influenced me very heavily um, and then the next thing that influenced me very heavily was um, beginning to compile data sets about how much space universities actually have and then trying to understand that distribution uh, because, you know, for example, some state systems, uh, Texas is an example, uh, Georgia does not follow this path, but Texas, the Higher Education Coordinating Board says 10 assignable square feet of classroom space per student FTE. Well, if that were true, then you'd expect to look at the data of how much space institutions actually have, and you'd expect to see some clustering of, of data around 10 square feet per student. And as we looked at those data sets, we didn't see any clustering. They were essentially all linearly distributed, which kind of gave us permission to say formulas are never going to solve this problem because there isn't actually a right number uh, of how much space you need in any category. And that was exactly the kind of um, permission and kind of analytical insight that enabled our teams to move away from predictive formulae and focus much more on space management. So I don't think it's particularly interesting to tell an institution, you need a million square feet. You can't afford any of it, but you need it. And thank you very much. Send me the check. It was a great consulting experience, um, which honestly, to some extent, was the paradigm. Years. Maybe I'm not a very good business person. Maybe that's what the, the, the list. Anyway, um, so changing that conversation to say, what space do we have? How are we using it? What are the improvement? What are the possibilities for improvement? was a large genesis of the conversation. And it turns out to get into that conversation, it's as much about policy decisions as it is about calculations and square footage and anything of that nature. So there's a long-winded answer to a simple question. Yes. The, um, the need for the analysis, though, is somewhere in that, in that conversation. Um, Let's talk about the University System of Georgia study that, that you did with uh, Alan Travis and, and others there within the USG and uh, how that was done and what general conclusions you may have from that. Mm. So that, that, that was a, a, a wonderful opportunity uh, that I had while I was still at Sasaki. Uh, and essentially what, what happened was that uh, several cycles before this, we had done, again, I've been fortunate to work with Alan, um, who's been one of my great collaborators over the last several years, on a capital prioritization exercise for the University System of Georgia. And we explored there the beginnings of some kinds of attempts to attach metrics to potential return and other things. And it was, honestly, I think our results were mixed, but our intentions were noble. And we learned a lot from that exercise. And I think what Alan kind of continued to observe which matched my experience um, was that the there was a, not, there wasn't a strong connection between the master planning exercises that the individual institutions and campuses were going through and the resulting capital requests that the system was seeing. And Alan really wanted to try to connect those two processes as as any 
rational human being would. Um, so that was one drive. And then the other drive, obviously, with uh, uh, Chancellor Huckabee uh, coming on board um, and uh, I think very wisely focusing on uh, improved utilization as a system strategic goal, which it absolutely should ha should be. And it's a very wise decision. Then the question was, OK, well, how the heck are we going to do that? Uh, how do we understand how we're utilizing things today? What should, where should we be looking for improvements? So uh, you had mentioned leadership earlier, and, and, and leadership is absolutely one of the keys to any successful planning engagement. And that was uh, the key driving force here. And um, working again with, with a, a bunch of talented folks at different institutions and a, a large consultant team, we were given carte blanche. Throw out, throw out the baby, throw out the bathwater, throw out the bath. Uh, think about it from scratch. What should we be measuring? How should we be classifying space? Let's all come up with some great ideas together. So it was just a magnificent opportunity, and it's uh, it's some work that I'm really proud of. Well, the we will have we will have read that uh, document, uh, or at least the we will have read the the SCUP uh, version yeah. of that of that particular study. But as you, you look back on this work now, a year and a half or so later, uh, what are the kinds of things that you take from that that inform your practice now? Yeah, thank you, no, that's a good question. I think, so the, 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 first, the first key insight that the team came to was that one of the things that was hampering us the most was the way that space was classified. So if you look at a traditional kind of FICOM methodology, there are various buckets for different kinds of university space. Um, and that may have made sense in 1860X. I'm not so sure it makes as much sense in, in today. Um, so, you know, for example, you have conference rooms that are classified as 350 space in the office category versus meeting rooms that are classified as 600 space, 680. So, you know, and, and the distinction is who's using the room or something, you know. So you, you get some of these very nuanced, you have, the, you have the idea of the student center and you have the idea of the library. And those are very separate things within the classification scheme. One will always fall under 400, one will always fall under 600. So it, it reflects a very kind of siloed mentality which I think is the opposite of what you need to achieve if you're hoping to improve utilization. And, and, and also it's just not reflective of the way that we use space today. Uh, so the first kind of key takeaway was to sort of say, okay, how can we create some um, a, a taxonomy with sort of super buckets that, that group space in ways that better reflect modern usage practices? Uh, because if you're not, if you don't have the right content, it's very hard to work out metrics on, on how to use them. So that was that was the first kind of key observation. Um, and then from that, we moved into uh, a, a couple of other things um, that I think were interesting. Uh, folks always gravitate towards classroom analysis because there's rich data and and it's easy to think about. Even though, of course, it's a fraction of the space, and we'd all be much better spent arguing about office space. But you know, it is what it is. Um, and I, I think we were able to come to a very good place on classrooms. And the, the key insight there was that sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and be, being able to sort of visualize everything that matters about classrooms, which from my perspective would be kind of a, a, a room utilization percentage for individual rooms, and then a sense of the overall fit of the, the sizes of the rooms in the portfolio versus the sizes of section enrollments. Uh, being able to get all of that into kind of one diagram, one number, was was satisfying. I, I would admit, and the team did great work on that, and, and then so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, other key takeaways was that once once we had the methodology in place and we were able to apply it system wide, so that's a great experiment. I mean, you're talking about 90 million square feet on 70 campuses, or no, it's not 70. Maybe it is 70. Yeah, is that right? I forget now. Something like that. 31 institutions. Um, then that's an incredibly rich data set, and you know Alan can speak to it better than I can, but it, but it certainly has informed the latest round of capital planning, and we saw all the same patterns: huge, unbelievable distributions that you know sort of make your head explode, and you know, you'll have a, you would have had a chance to see some of that data in in the SCUP article. Um, but when it's easy to sort of glaze over because all the pictures look the same, right? It's just a line of dots going like this. But when you think about what that actually represents, it, it's mind blowing to me. 
And uh, and then I guess the last thing would be to say that you know, again I was fortunate to work with a number of institutions on what is all the, what does this all mean? What should we think about for how we want to invest our capital moving forward? And th that conversation shifted, and folks really did focus on saying, well, okay, our classroom utilization isn't that hot. Maybe we should be turning some of the classrooms into some other kind of space and our classroom metric will improve and our overall learning environment will improve and, and so on and so forth. And that, that was the goal, so that was great. Terrific. One of the things we're trying to do in this class is to step away from the anecdotal uh, perception, the story about one thing and another, and begin to take a look at different institutions as if they were uh, examples of a particular species. Uh, and and uh, um, I think we've talked about that metaphor before. Uh, from, from your standpoint at this point, you've worked on 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe perhaps less. Okay, 60-ish. About 60-ish a little over 60, I think, is the current yeah. number. Yeah, okay. And so, so you, have, you have a lot of practical, personal experience with 60 members of this uh, species. Um, <laughs> and, and, I think that's, and I think that's worthwhile. Uh, but well, as, you. as you, think about, you think about the future of this, these institutions, mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you think about that? Hmm. I believe that uh, you, you and I have discussed this at length, so you're, you're a little bit baiting the bear, and I, I appreciate that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think place-based education is going anywhere. Um, I, I think technology will impact that, and, um, and I know you have strong feelings on this one as well. Um, but, you know, my, my view is that everything we're understanding about learning today promotes kind of active and engaged learning models. Um, and that's leading to improved learning outcomes. And so to me, the whole kind of MOOC distraction um, is, is kind of in some ways the opposite of that. Now, I'm all for leveraging the power of technology to provide greater access, and you know, I don't disagree on that in any way. But I, my concern is not that uh, place-based education will go away, but rather that there'll be increased stratification and that those folks who are able to afford a place-based education will buy their ticket into the club uh, and will have improved learning outcomes because of that active and engaged environment. And those folks who can't afford that and um, who, are, who are doing mostly online education um, may not fare as well, and, and who knows? So that my, my worry is more about that kind of stratification and the uh, kind of um, equality argument than as a kind of existential threat to the, to the model as, as we know it. Now, don't get me wrong. I, uh, we could, you know, spend another whole session like this talking about financial models for universities and um, ways that those could be strengthened. Um, but you know, I, there's some interesting data coming out of the University of Nebraska that looks, at least in the publics, at the cost of education. And what their data convinced me, which is easy to do, uh, was that you know, the the consumer price index for education in the publics wasn't tracking that differently from overall consumer price indices. And so the publics are just experiencing cost shifting as state state support decreases. And um, and I wonder if there isn't potentially a lesson in that for the privates as well. So, um, so yes, there are economic questions and, and they need to be addressed and the, the cost of education can't continue to increase indefinitely at three to 4% a year, I, I, I get that. Um, and perhaps technology can help leverage some of that. Um, but I, I don't believe that the campus as a place is going anywhere. And, and I certainly don't disagree with that. I, th I think we share the concern about the uh, preservation, the maintenance of that, the availability of that experience for the maximum number of students, believing that there is value that derives from that community-based and face-to-face -face activity. In this course, we'll be dealing with that, that complex of questions. 
What I'd like to turn now to is that longer perspective of the evolution and transition of these institutions as we who are engaged in the campus planning process see it, whether it's the wave of one kind of project showing up in the requirements or whether it's a, a change in reimbursement strategy that influences uh, student access and, and behavior. As you anticipate the next 10 years of, of your practice, what are the, shall we say, three or four things that you're looking for or anticipating will be the focus of your, uh, your personal and your firm's uh, professional work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the renewal question is certainly one that's that sort of, you know, it's time has come. It's time probably came a long time ago. Uh, renewal. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that to, to the extent that one of my pet theories that the, is that the ways that, that publics have stayed competitive with privates is that they've essentially used their facilities like an endowment and drawn down on that by underinvesting in, in capital renewal. And that's not a sustain, long-term sustainable strategy. Um, so figuring out how to do that while meeting evolving program needs and mission goals, that's challenging. Uh, but I, I just, you can't punt on that forever. So right. helping folks think about that, I think is, is critically important. Um, you know, obviously I would say research environments um, are having to respond to a radically different um, uh, funding model as, 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 as the federal, federal funding environment shifts. And, thinking about the appropriate role of private sector partners in that world while still maintaining the credibility and um, uh, impartiality that you would expect a university to have. Uh, that's, that's a huge topic. Uh, I think, you know, the, the healthcare stuff does impact a lot of what we do because, um, you know, the academic medical centers are always evolving and they're very complex places. Um, and I, I can, I can't see that work uh, diminishing in any way as, 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 as needs increase. Um, one thing that I've become extremely interested in is trying to understand the social networks within universities um, and bringing the same kind of analytic rigor to that investigation as we brought to space utilization, because I think we do have tools available to us now to be more analytical and more kind of rigorous as we, as we, as we evaluate those social networks. And the projects that we've begun to do that on have shown some very, very promising returns and convinced provosts and others that, you know, maybe we should uh, go left instead of right. So I think that will continue to grow. Um, but, you know, I guess if I were to sum everything up, it's, it, 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 I would say this, constraints are not the enemy. Constraints are not the enemy of good design. Constraints are not the enemy of a great university. Constraints are the constellations which guide us to good answers. And if you follow the constraints, they will lead you to good solutions. And it's about peeling away the noise from that world. Um, and that's a fascinating thing to get to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Indeed it is. I think we'll end there. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Gregory Jenks, who is a founding uh, a co-founder of the new firm, Dumont Jenks. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time.